Thanks for coming tonight to this important reading from Bullets into Bells, Poets and Citizens Respond to Gun Violence. It's presented by Bear Pond Books with Gun Sense Vermont. It's hard to say I am thrilled to present this program tonight because as much as I love this book, I wish it didn't have to exist. As much as the poems and testimonies in this book move me, I wish there wasn't such a great and unfortunately growing need for these narratives. Narratives that bridge violence, hope, healing, and strength. Narratives that push you to the brink of tears, or if you're like me, over the brink, and then push you to want to do better. We have to do better to prevent the kinds of violent tragedies that pushed this book into existence. With that, I urge you all to vote by Tuesday, November 6th. Use your empowered voice and vote for a better world for all of us, for our kids, for our communities, for our neighbors, and for ourselves. If you are moved by what you hear tonight, I urge you to buy a copy of the book. They make great gifts to teachers, poetry lovers, or friends in high places like the State House. Uh, books will be on sale right at the front of the stage here after the reading. Bear Pond Books will donate proceeds of tonight's book sales to Gun Sense Vermont. And please also visit the little table with the basket and feel free to donate for them tonight as well. Um, we had to hire security tonight. We received word that an oppositional force was going to protest our reading. Thankfully, that did not happen. Um, but it did detract funds from our donations from tonight. Ticket sales were going to help a donation to Gun Sense. So our priority is, of course, a safe and peaceful event. And so I'm asking you to make it your priority to help organizations tonight, organizations like Gun Sense Vermont. I want to thank our poets and speakers for coming tonight, some as far away as Newtown, Connecticut. Thank you. Brian Clements. Unfortunately, we learned last minute that Abby Clements was unable to make it, so um, her parts in the program will be read by other presenters tonight. Another thank you to our co-sponsor, Gun Sense Vermont, and to the Vermont Arts Council, who designated Bullets into Bells a Vermont Arts 2018 reading. I'd also like to thank our media sponsors, WGDR, Goddard College Community Radio, they're here tonight recording for the Bon Mott Poetry Show. And Orca Media, filming for public access television. Please feel free to sign up for the Bear Pond Books newsletter that's at the front table. We will send out a link for the video of tonight's reading. And I thank you all again for coming. This is going to be a truly touching evening of powerful poems. Please refer to your program for the order of events and to learn more about our amazing poets and speakers. To start off tonight with opening remarks, please help me welcome the Executive Director of Gun Sense Vermont, Clay Lasher Summers. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I just wanted to say um, that for all of us, we should just take a moment, settle into our space. It's been a tough week. It's been a tough couple of weeks. Um, and I wanted to thank you for all of you who helped us um, this past session at the State House um, enact three bills that I think will make a big difference in the state of Vermont. I think that's all I'm really going to say about that. Um, but I wanted to say that the language of gun violence as we know it is often fraught with rhetorical speech. It's either yes or no. People use the speech um, to raise money, not to raise money. Um, and that, to me, I think has always been one of the upsetting things about this. Um, we need to do away with language that is so divisive. Um, and I think, and I know, 
that what Bullets into Bells has done has brought us to a place where the poets are taking over and where the poets are saying there's another way to look at this. So that is all I would really like to say. Um, but my friend Brian is here, and the way that Brian and I know each other, we knew each other before the book. Um, I'm a gun violence survivor, and Brian and Abby are gun violence survivors. And there's a family that weaves us together. So if I only see Brian once a year, we are together and we are settled in our space, and I'm delighted that he and the other poets are here. So with that, Brian will come speak. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks also to Samantha uh, for all the work that you've put into making this event happen. We really appreciate all your work. And thanks, too, for Bear, to Bear Pond Books. I'm very happy to hear that proceeds from this event will go to um, Clay's organization. Um, might also point out that uh, the money that the bookstore gave to Beacon Press <laughs> to get those books uh, actually will go to the Peace Center of Connecticut. All of our proceeds from book sales for this year are going to the Peace Center of Connecticut, which, which is an organization in Hartford that works on the ground to uh, net opportunities for gun violence to happen in the bud and to work with uh, gangs and gang members and young people who are on the streets a lot to help prevent gun violence among them. So thank you all for that. I especially want to also thank Clay and Matthew and Major, uh, not only for being here tonight, but also for being a part of the Bullets into Bells project. Um, thank you so much for being a part of it. The work that you all do is really the heart of this project, and it's an honor to share these pages and the stage with you. I also send um, greetings and regrets from my wife, Abby, who intended to be here tonight. Um, since um, the Sandy Hook shootings, um, in addition to holding together a classroom, helping to hold together a school, a school district, a community, and a family, Abby has worked what is essentially the equivalent of two and a half full-time jobs. She continues to teach in Newtown, um, but she also devotes a lot of her time working with her union, the American Federation of Teachers, working nationally to educate and organize teachers on gun violence issues and to fight to keep guns out of schools and to resist arming teachers. Um, recently, she co-organized a conference that brought uh, 100 high school students to Washington, D.C. a couple of weekends ago uh, to help those students learn how to advocate for themselves on gun violence issues in schools and in their neighborhoods. Uh, Abby's also uh, co-lead of the Connecticut chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. She's helped or start 14 new groups in the state in the last year, since Parkland, actually. Um, so she's been quite busy. And um, last weekend, the, um, the shootings in Pittsburgh hit her hard, as they do, these shootings do all of us. These mass shootings hit all of us hard, but uh, survivors of mass shootings are especially hard hit by these incidents. Um, so she's recuperating from that and I'm gonna go home tonight and try to convince her not to go to a 5K walk tomorrow. <laughs> um, we find ourselves here um, in a deep breath, a deep anxious breath before Tuesday's election. I trust that many of you have already voted uh, since you have early voting here. We do not have that in Connecticut, unfortunately. We have to vote on Tuesday, which is a shame. Um, and I'm sure for a lot of you, or most of you, and a lot of other people, gun violence is an important issue on the mind uh, while voting, regardless of where you stand on these issues, um, pro-Second Amendment or anti-Second Amendment, um, pro-legislation to prevent gun violence or anti-more legislation. 
what I'm not convinced about, though, is that gun violence issues actually swing any votes. My guess is that um, pre-existing political affiliation is probably a pretty good predictor of how you stand on issues related to gun violence and guns. A third of the country is always going to vote Democratic. A third of the country is always going to vote Republican. There's a third in the middle there. Um, I suspect half of those usually vote one way and half of those usually vote the other way. I know that there are some people who are in that middle for whom guns and gun violence is a number one issue, but there aren't that many people, not enough to swing elections. We can't rely on elections to fix this for us. We know that elections are, impo are important. They're not the only solution to this. We really have a, a two-front problem here. There's the electoral political problem, and maybe in this election and the next election we will elect a Congress that is committed to doing something about gun violence legislation, and maybe in the next presidential election we'll get a president who's willing to cooperate with them on that. But it's just as likely that in the next election or the election after that, we'll lose that. We can't rely upon that. The major front on this issue is a long-term cultural change. We have to be responsible for making that change happen among ourselves, with each other, with our families, in our communities, at our places of worship, at the places we work, by having tough conversations um, with the people in our lives. The function of and the intent and the purpose of this project, Bullets into Bells, has never been to change anyone's vote. It has always been to build empathy in audiences and in communities. We've been doing events like this one all over the country. We hope to eventually do at least one in every state of the, of the union. Uh, but we're having these conversations and hearing people talk about their experiences with gun violence and their commitment to ending gun violence. That's a long-term project to change the way we think about guns in this country and think about gun violence and the roles of guns in our everyday lives. And the other issues that guns feed into, guns aren't our only problem in gun violence, of course. We have a mental health issue in this country. We have a domestic violence issue in this country. We have a teen impulse suicide issue in this country. We have a veteran suicide issue in this country. We have a gang violence issue in this country. We have a road rage issue in this country. We have a white supremacy issue in this country. And guns make all those problems worse. All of them. So we have to change the way we think about all of those issues and the way we think about guns in order to achieve real cultural change um, in this country. And my hope is that this project helps to do that in some small way. Now it's also possible that there are a lot of people in this country like my brother-in-law who agrees with me that we need to improve our background check system in this country. He agrees with me that there's no reason for civilians to own 100 round magazines. There's no reason for civilians to own bump stocks. He agrees with me that in households where there's been domestic violence or someone is under severe mental or emo emotional distress, someone else in that household should be able to ask to have the guns removed from that household. But he's not willing to support any legislation on any of those issues because he's afraid that it will lead to a slippery slope that will not allow him to own the 17 guns that he currently owns, or more. Maybe that's where we are as a country. Maybe the current political atmosphere in this country is a real reflection of the heart and soul of our country right now. But I choose not to believe that. And I know the other people in this book choose not to believe that. And I hope you choose not to believe that. And that you will leave here tonight and do something on some issue related to gun violence that will help participate in the conversation about stopping deaths from guns. 
Um, I've referred to this uh, as a project rather than as a book because really the book is only one of three parts of this project that is Bulletin to Bells. Uh, the second part, as I mentioned, is events like this, which we're doing all across the country. Um, I think we've done about 30 of them so far in churches and libraries and on college campuses and community centers and private homes. Um, we'll continue to do those and engage in these conversations and I hope that in the Q&A section at the end of this event that some of you will feel free and comfortable enough to ask questions or even to tell us a story about your experience uh, with gun violence and, and share your experience. I know that can be difficult to do. <clears throat> the third part of the project is a website, bulletintobells.com, um, where we continue to pu publish additional poems about gun violence, essays, interviews, uh, videos, uh, all kinds of content. We'll continue to do that into the future, and we invite everyone here to visit the website. There are also opportunities for action there from time to time, um, not only to read the content that is there, but also possibly to submit some stuff if you have poems or essays or op-eds or something like that, a video that you would be interested in sending to us. We would be happy to have you do that. Um, like many of you, I'm sure I grew up around guns. Uh, I grew up in Arkansas and Mississippi, mostly Arkansas. Um, enjoyed shooting guns when I was a kid. I was actually pretty good at ski shooting. Um, but I also like Many of you, on a day-to-day -day basis, heard about gun violence when I was growing up on TV, shootings in Little Rock, armed robberies, um, wounded shooting, killed shooting. I had a classmate in high school who committed suicide with a gun. I have people in my extended family who've been on both ends of gun violence, giving it and receiving it. But I did what most people do in this country. I ignored it. I said, that's awful. I'm so glad it wasn't us. Until, of course, the day it was us. And I'm ashamed to say that it was Sandy Hook, that it took Sandy Hook to wake me up, to get me active on this issue. The poem that I'm gonna read uh, tonight from the book is my poem called 22. Um, this is the first poem that I wrote uh, after Sandy Hook. It took me about a year and a half to get it out. And it deals with a lot of the issues that I've been talking to you about already. 22. The guy my girlfriend ran off with in 1983 drove a rusted out beetle and carried a 22 pistol for runs to the bank to drop off nightly deposits at the General Cinema where he was assistant manager and where I worked and saw Rocky Horror about 20 times more than I wanted to in egg and TP drenched midnight shows. He lived in a rat trap, roach infested, leaning over shack on the edge of the heights, a few streets over from the house where in 2004, a local TV reporter was murdered in her bed, her face beaten beyond recognition. In 1988, on my first night as assistant manager at a restaurant in Dallas, a fight broke out between a pimp and a private investigator, who also may have been a pimp. A group of frat boys decided to jump in and knocked the whole scrum over onto the floor just on the other side of the bar for me. The pimp came up, pointing a 22 semi-automatic directly at the closest object, which happened to be my forehead. He didn't shoot just waved his gun around until everyone cowered under their tables and calmly walked out the front door and down the street. My best friend in sixth or seventh grade moved to Arkansas from New Mexico. Ron's skin was lizard rough. He raised hamsters and hermit crabs. I struck him out for the last out of the Little League Championship and we went out to his father's farm and shot cans and bottles with his 22 rifle. Back in New Mexico, he'd had some health problems and his mother had shot herself in the head. A few years ago, a dead body was found buried on his father's property. Ron's son ended up shooting himself in the head as well. He was 22. On December 14, 2012, 
An armed intruder entered the Sandy Hook School with two pistols, a Bushmaster 223, hundreds of rounds of ammunition, and a shotgun in the car. Rather than turn right toward my wife's classroom, where she pulled two kids into her room from the hallway, he turned to the left, murdered 20 children and six adults, including the principal and the school psychologist, both of whom went into the hallway to stop the gunman and shot two other teachers who survived. After that, a lot of other things happened, but it doesn't really matter what. So this book um, has a call and response structure. Matt and I were talking about it before, before the reading. Uh, it's kind of a unique anthology. One of the unique things about it is that each poem is paired with a response from a gun violence survivor or an activist or a community leader or a national leader like Senator Chris Murphy or an international leader like Nobel Peace Laureate Jody Williams. Uh, so uh, the book turns into a kind of a conversation between poems and respondents. Uh, the response to my poem was written by Poe Kim Murray, who is the, one of the founders of an organization called Newtown Action Alliance, which was one of the several organizations that popped up in Newtown after the shootings at Sandy Hook. Poe says, it did not matter to the National Rifle Association, the Republican members of Congress, Donald Trump, Republican governors, Republican state legislators, and some Demo Democratic legislators, that my neighbor killed his mother in her bed then drove to Sandy Hook Elementary School to brutally gun down 20 children and six educators with an AR-15 with high capacity magazines, or that 100,000 Americans are killed or injured by guns in our towns and cities across the nation every single year, or that there are nearly 300 mass shooting incidents annually. It mattered to us. We are a group of Newtown, Connecticut neighbors and friends who form the Newtown Action Alliance a grassroots group advocating for cultural and legislative changes to end gun violence in our nation. It mattered to 90% of Americans who support expanded background checks. It mattered to families of victims and survivors directly impacted by gun violence. Because it still matters to us, we will work to hold all state and federal elected representatives accountable for standing with the NRA instead of taking action to keep all of us safe, safe from gun violence. Despite the NRA rhetoric, we know firsthand that guns kill and guns don't make us safer. Thank you. Good evening. I'm deeply gratified by your presence here tonight and want to thank Brian and Clay for their activism and their work. And um, I'm very proud to be a part of this book. I think it's um, uh, not only timely, regretfully, but also in a substantive way, um, gives voice to what I feel is um, something that might be easily to rationalize away. Um, gun violence is, um, is traumatizing, whether you are uh, in this city of which it occurs. Um, it seems like my life has been defined by gun violence from a short kid from where I grew up. Um, but I've worked very much to kind of keep mindful of the fact that this is not normal. And um, <clears throat> to deal with um, particularly the fact, and it's a difficult fact, is that um, so much of our history uh, involves this nature of, of violence. The plundering of bodies is a fact of our uh, coming uh, to age as, uh, as a country, um, and particularly uh, black bodies. And so um, the shooting of unarmed people, I want to say black people, but it happens all over this country, but um, is something that uh, we should always be mindful of that they are unarmed and there are other ways by which to um, uh, enact the law. Uh, this poem I'm going to read is called uh, Ferguson and of course it deals with 
uh, Michael Brown. Um, one of the uh, <laughs> one of the aspects of of Michael Brown's life, of course, and justification is that he was um, a criminal, um, and chiefly because of his black body. We know that, um, and scholars have talked about this, that much like laws like Stand Your Ground, uh, these are laws that are flawed by the fact that uh, the black body has been constructed as a body to fear. And so that when police pull their gun uh, to shoot, they're already acting from a space of, of fear. Um, Part of that equation also means dehumanizing the body so that um, render them not human, render them animal-like, render them something that must be stopped. I wanted to um, play with this and try to, in a kind of surrealist fashion, deal with the trauma of that um, event, but also the second trauma, which was the fact that uh, Michael Brown's body laid on a street for four hours. That was the second trauma of that particular day. Ferguson. Once there was a boy who thought it a noble idea to lie down in the middle of the street and sleep. For four hours, no one bothered him, but let him lie on the road as though he were an enchantment. This became newsworthy, and soon helicopters hovered above posing his curled torso and thick legs and spotlights televised the world over. Foreign correspondents focused on the neighborhood and its relative poverty as recognized by the plethora of low-hanging jeans worn by shirtless men and loud music issuing from passing cars, which had the effect of drowning out everyone's already bottled up thoughts about the boy sleeping in the middle of the street. Others jumped in front of cameras, seizing an opportunity to be seen by their relatives on the other side of town because they had run out of minutes on prepaid cell phones. The roadkill in the neighborhood and some on that very block, rodents, cats, possums, feeling equal amounts of jealousy and futility, each began to rise and return to their den holes cursing the boy sleeping in the street beneath their breaths for his virtuosic performance of stillness and tribulation in the city. The drug-addicted men and women leaning into doorways like art installations were used to being ignored, but they too felt affronted by the boy sleeping in the street and folded their cardboard homes. For the first hour, he practiced not breathing. For 10 seconds, he would hold his breath, and then he practiced longer sets of minutes during the next three hours until he was unable to stretch out his non-breathing for whole hunks at a time. When his breathing returned, it was so faint, his chest and shoulders barely moved. Infinitesimal amounts of life poured out of him, but no one noticed. The police cordoned off his body and after some time declared him dead because they had only seen black men lying prone on the street as corpses, but never as sleeping humans. The whole world, eager and hungry for a Lazarus moment, watched and waited to see when he would awaken and rise to his feet, especially his neighbors with minutes remaining on cell phones who filmed and animatedly discourse behind yellow tape the ecstasies and muted sorrows of watching a boy sleep in the middle of the street. The response to Major's poem was written by Amber Goodwin, who is uh, activist and organizer, and she is the founder and executive director of the Community Justice Reform Coalition. She says, Ferguson changed everything. This poem exemplifies that fact, but was equal parts hard to read and to digest, just like Ferguson. 
I think this poem tried to look at Michael Brown that for once was referred to as an actual human, not just as a victim or a body, or at least tried to get there. I think this was a way to try to humanize such an inhuman action that happened that day due to gun violence. On the other hand, how do we deal with the inhumane action of words in this writing and what actually happened? Or is the actual question, do we ever deal with it? Lord only knows, but we have to talk about it in ways that will never forget what happened and also will never forget the uprising and spark that followed. It changed me. It changed this country. Ferguson changed everything. You whom I could not say, listen to me. Can we agree Kevlar? Backpacks shouldn't be needed for children walking to school. Those same children shouldn't also require a suit of armor when standing on their front lawns or snipers to watch their backs as they eat at McDonald's. They shouldn't have to stop to consider the speed of a bullet or how it might reshape their bodies. But one winter back in Detroit, I had one student who opened a door and died. It was the front door to his house, but it could have been any door and the bullet could have written any name. The shooter was 13 years old and was aiming at someone else, but a bullet doesn't care about aim. It doesn't distinguish between the innocent and the innocent, and how was this bullet supposed to know this child would open the door at the exact wrong moment because his friend was outside and screaming for help? Did I say I had one student who opened a door and died, that's wrong. There were many. The classroom of grief had far more seats than the classroom for math, though every student in the classroom for math could count the names of the dead. A kid opens a door. The bullet couldn't possibly know, nor could the gun, because guns don't kill people. They don't have minds to decide such things. They don't choose or have a conscience. And when a man doesn't have a conscience, we call him a psychopath. This is how we know what type of assault rifle a man can become and how we discover the hell that thrums inside each of them. Today, there's another shooting with dead everywhere. It was a school, a movie theater, a parking lot. The world is full of doors, and you, who I could not save, may enter a door and enter a meadow or a eulogy, and if the latter, you will be mourned, then buried in rhetoric. There will be monuments of legislation, little flowers made from red tape. What should we do? We'll ask again. The earth will close like a door above you. What should we do? And that click you hear, that's, and that click you hear, that's just our voices, the deadbolt of discourse sliding into place. Thank you guys for being here. I'm gonna read uh, the, uh, a response to that from uh, Shannon Watts, founder of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. It took the mass shooting of 20 babies and six educators at an elementary school in Connecticut to wake me up to the reality that gun violence can happen to anyone, anywhere, at any time in America. No one gets out of America unscathed. We all have a story about someone we know who was shot and killed or irreparably injured. And while the details of the victim's stories differ, the outcome is the same, death and destruction. I didn't choose to get involved in gun violence prevention. I was drafted, I was drafted by a war that kills more than 90 Americans every day and injures hundreds more. I'm serving as boots on the ground, working side by side with mothers and other women to help stem the tide of lives lost. Babies, toddlers, students, veterans, families, no one is immune to the senseless and sudden toll of a bullet and will remain on the front lines until many generations from now, the battle against the insanity of so many guns and so few laws is won by our children and our children's children. But the fight has to start somewhere. And for me, it started in, New in Newtown. Thank you. Hi. Um, so 
Samantha Colbert. I'm here to read the poem, When a Child Hears Gunshots, by Megan Privatello. When a child hears gunshots, she will say, Mom is beating the pots and pans. She will say, it sounds like home. Let's keep it this way. Our children misinterpreting the sound of dying as a crude percussion. When they kneel at their beds and ask God where he was, when their best friend stopped being alive, he will say, I was at the drive-thru. I was so hungry, I thought the gunshots were my stomach begging for food. He will say, I know nothing until strangers tell me about it first. I could have bullet wounds in my hands, and I'd know nothing about what hurts, what doesn't hurt. What a God making the world out of variations of madness, refusing to hold its face in his hands, and saying, you, you are mine. It is not ours, the young blood, the unfinished drawings, the last blurry thoughts before a world goes black, when God is busy wiping grease from his mouth. We can stand in a line with the dead in our backpacks, next to our pencils and our snacks. He won't notice when we give the whole damned world back. Here's the response to When a Child Hears Gunshots from Abby Clemens, second grade teacher at Sandy Hook Elementary School on December 14, 2012, and gun violence prevention activist. 154 shots, they heard them all. I thought they were folding chairs falling. We huddled into the coats and backpacks. Some of them cried, some of them laughed. How could they know? And if they knew, how could they believe? We shared a water bottle, a blue one, passing it around, little arms poking out to take it. We waited. We had to believe the police were who they said they were. I opened the door. They scattered, a few in my outstretched stretched arms. We ran. We were lucky. Surviving is a gift and a burden. What do you do with that? For me, as soon as I could, I started to fight. I fight to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. I fight to keep guns locked up and away from curious toddlers and depressed teens. I fight against arming teachers. And I fight to keep guns out of college dorms and classrooms. Lockdowns, active shooter drills, and backpacks that morph into shields aren't the answer. Parents shouldn't have to worry about whether or not their kids will make it home from school. A year or two after the tragedy, one mom told me that every day after school, she left a gift for her daughter sitting on her bed, a celebration for making it home. Always and Forever by Ocean Vuong. Open this when you need me most, he said, as he slid the shoebox wrapped in duct tape beneath my head. His thumb, still damp from the shutter between mother's thighs, kept circling the mole above my brow. The devil's eye blazed between his teeth, or was he lighting a joint? It doesn't matter. Tonight, I wake and mistake the bath water wrung from mother's hair for his voice. I open the shoebox, dust it with seven winters, and here, 
su sunk in folds of yellow newspaper lies the Colt 45, silent and heavy as an amputated hand. I hold the gun and wonder if an entry wound in the night would make a hole wide as morning, that if I look through it, I would see the end of this sentence, or maybe just a man kneeling at the boy's bed, his gray overalls reeking of gasoline and cigarettes. Maybe the day will close without the page turning as he wraps his arms around the boy's milk blue shoulders the boy pretending to be asleep as his father's clutch tightens, the way the barrel aimed at the sky must tighten around a bullet to make it speak. I tell you this, there is no language for night bullets. My stepfather shot me with a 30 odd six hunting rifle when I was 13 years old on the coldest of nights in January 1970. It cut and sliced its way through my back, leaving shrapnel that still leaves my body. The force ruined a kidney and shocked the nerves of my spine so that I could not walk for months. I resist the language of the telling of being shot. Really, this is it. This truth of gun violence and domestic violence. First, he beat my mother and brother. And then, as I became the protector of my family, he took to chasing me along the Connecticut River with his gun and his dog. He leaned in to rape me and I resisted with fury only available to the knowing of a child. He would take that gun and hang me from a wall night after night, metal below chin and pinned. I sit with parents now who have had their child shot. I see the wild-eyed terror of their children the seconds before they were shot. It is terror so visceral that I must tell the truth. I'll be reading a poem by Martina Spada, and I want to thank you all for Coming. Uh, my name is Karen McCadden, and I appreciate the chance to read a poem as a high school teacher in this community. Heal the Cracks in the Bell of the World by Martine Espada. For the community of Newtown, Connecticut, where 20 students and six educators lost their lives to a gunman at Sandy Hook Elementary School, December 14, 2012. Now the bells speak with their tongues of bronze, now the bells open their mouths of bronze to say, listen to the bells a world away. Listen to the bell in the ruins of a city where children gathered copper shells like beach glass. And the copper boiled in the foundry and the bell born in the foundry says, I was born of bullets, but now I sing of a world where bullets melt into bells. Listen to the bell in a city where cannons from the armies of the Great War sank into molten metal, bubbling like a vat of chocolate. And the many mouths that once spoke the tongue of smoke form the one mouth of a bell that says, I was born of cannons, but now I sing of a world where cannons melt into bells. Listen to the bells in a town with a flagpole on Main Street a rooster weather vane keeping watch atop the meeting house, the congregation gathering to sing in times of great silence. Here the bells rock their heads of bronze, as if to say, melt the bullets into bells, melt the bullets into bells. 
Here the bells raise their heavy heads as if to say, melt the cannons into bells, melt the cannons into bells. Here the bells sing of a world where weapons crumble deep in the earth and no one remembers where they were buried. Now the bells pass the word at midnight in the ancient language of bronze, from bell to bell, like ships smuggling news of liberation from island to island, the song rippling through the clouds. Now the bells chime like the muscle beating in every chest, heal the cracks in the bell of every face listening to the bells. The chimes heal the cracks in the bell of the moon. The chimes heal the cracks in the bell of the world. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all for your moving readings. Uh, greatly appreciated. That poem, of course, uh, is the title poem for the book. We took the title of the book uh, from one of the lines there. Um, and the response to that poem was written by David and Francine Wheeler, who are parents of Ben Wheeler, who was one of the children who was killed at Sandy Hook. Um, David and Francine also founded an organization called Ben's Lighthouse after the shooting because Ben was very fond of lighthouses. In the period following the murder of our son, this poem was read at several gatherings and at one I, David, spoke the words myself. We feel the irony of the location of our loss, Connecticut, the birthplace of the American firearms industry. Newtown, the home of that industry's trade group, He's referring to the NSSF there, the National Sports Shooting Foundation. Nearby Waterbury, the former brass foundry capital of the country, where furnaces melted brass to make bells, shifting their production to shell casings for the war effort. New Haven, home of Eli Whitney, who advanced the mass production of firearms more than anyone. To move through this landscape, day after day, carrying the weight of our murdered boy and the hole in our hearts, just his shape and size, is an unwanted permanent texture of our lives. It is, however, eclipsed in dimension by the support, assistance, and love of our community tucked in these same hills, a community where we work to support, teach, and help others through the organization Ben's Lighthouse, created to honor Ben, his classmates, and his teachers, working to heal wherever we can, <clears throat> helping is healing. So we stay and we listen for the bells. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. So we're going to open for questions and discussion. If anyone has any questions or would like to make any comments, unfortunately, we don't have a handheld or a stand for questions for the audience, so it might be best just to stand up. Would anyone on the panel like to add anything at this point? Anyone have any? Okay, sorry to press you, and put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, does anyone have a question or a comment? Just thank you for being so very kind and so brave. Just thank you for being so brave and sharing this with our community. Thank you what can we do? <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to use this thing, they tell me. So, do you live in Vermont? Yes, I'm in Upper Valley. Okay. So, there's a lot you can do. Um, and I think Brian has talked about that, we've all talked about that, and that is the simple thing of talking to your neighbors. Um, I don't think that this, we're going to win any, any of this battle um, unless people start talking to each other and talking in ways that matter. Um, I just want to say one thing before I tell you some concrete steps that you can do. But, um, I've always said, you know, being an old survivor, that, um, you know, there's one degree separation now between people who have been shot, people who know people who have been shot, 
family members. So if there is really one degree of separation, then this is part of all of our lives. Um, I've been watching this for a really long time. There's four shootings that have really affected me. Well, first there's the shootings that happen in urban America all the time, every single day. Every single day, and nobody speaks about these shootings. Nobody speaks about domestic violence in shootings. Um, I think one of the things that we can all do is become more informed um, about gun violence, about the ramifications about gun violence and, and the trauma that people experience when they experience gun violence. I think one of the things that is really important to do is get involved and work on legislation. Um, and if you would like to do that, I didn't bring any stickers or anything, I just got myself here. Um, you know, Gun Sense Vermont has a website and if you sign in, um, I'm happy to report that the awful website we have is being redesigned and will be launched in about three weeks. So this next session, we are going to be working on three different bills, um, and we need help to do that. Um, we need help at the State House, we need help raising money. Um, every time a group gets together to try to pass um, a good gun violence bill, it's like running a campaign. Um, it takes communications, it takes lobbyists, it takes people on the ground. So I'm happy to take your name, or maybe there's a sign-up sheet there. There's a sign-up sheet there, and I will put you on our, on our email list. Um, but before I, so that's one thing you can do. I mean, that's a huge, huge thing you can do. And I think the biggest thing is just to look at the issue not in terms of just Vermont, but what's happening all across the country. So that's a long answer. But I, I did want to say this one thing because I never really got finished with it. So I was shot in 1970, so I have been watching shootings since that time. One of the first shootings that really um, got to me was Columbine because it, it said to me, this is, this is what can be, this is what can happen in this country. Um, the next shooting that really um, affected me was a friend of mine who was shot in Chicago. Um, and going to Chicago and meeting um, a lot of the mothers who are working to prevent their children from being shot every single day. The another shooting that really affected me was Aurora because my daughter was there. Um, she had just been in Africa for a year and a half, and she has a pretty good sense about things, and she walked out of the line because she had a bad feeling. When Newtown happened, I think all of us fell apart, and a new version of gun violence prevention activism started. So for Newtown, I cried for a month, every single day, all day long, because I envisioned you know, when you're a child, there's a moment of space where you recognize that you're going to be shot. So there's a reckoning, right? There's, there's a real reckoning. I don't care how young that child is. And so I would see that, right? I wouldn't see it in terms of what I experienced, but what I knew that they experienced. And then after that, I have been watching shootings every single day. You know, it's like the alert goes off on my phone and I say, how could there be this happening? The shootings that happened this past week, before the shooting at the synagogue, there was a white man who shot two black grandparents at Walmart, I think. I think it was at Walmart. And I, um, you know, that, we've been watching the rate of shootings against people.
People of color rise and rise and rise. And then Saturday happened. And here we are today. So the biggest thing that we can do is to work together and to vote. You have to vote. And we just have to keep talking to each other because everyone who is an other is at risk. And I have always been an other because I was shot. So I identify probably more than even other people do about the people that are at risk. So open yourselves, open your hearts, and everyone you see, be kind, share love. There are many organizations, of course, who um, provide opportunities to take action. Um, if you just keep in touch with those organiza organizations, uh, Moms Demand Action is one of them. Gun Sense Vermont is another. Uh, the Brady Organization is another. Uh, what are some others, Clay? Oh, yeah, I didn't even tell you all of them. Um, Giffords. Um, microphone. So there's a lot of gun violence organizations. So, um, and you can look, if you live in a city, uh, there's like uh, Peace and Justice Center in um, Burlington, there's Giffords, um, there's Every Town, there's Moms Demand Action, there's Brady, there's us. Um, there's a lot of big national groups, um, which are some of those, but all you have to really do is go on the, the you know, the web and, you, put in gun violence groups and there's gonna be a huge list. So if anybody has interest, there is a mom's demand that is starting in Vermont. Um, so we can put you in touch with all of that. Now the Brady Organization has a program called Ask. Are you familiar with this program where they're encouraging um, parents to uh, talk to the parents of their children's friends when they're going over to the friend's house to make sure that the guns in those homes are safely stored if there are guns in those homes, um, which is eminently wise. Uh, I encourage you to do that on your own behalf as well because it's not just kids who get shot accidentally, adults get shot accidentally as well. Yes. I just wanted to mirror back to you what for me were crucial things, crucial connections that you made and offered us to consider. And so as a white male in Vermont, I feel obliged to say toxic heterosexism leads to gun violence. White supremacy leads to gun violence. Mass incarceration of people of violence. People of color treatment leads to gun violence. Systemic poverty leads to gun violence. All of these things are connected as you so eloquently offered to us tonight. And I think there's myriad ways we can work to move ahead on these issues, certainly through the organizations that you suggest, through our families, but especially at core for our communities. So just thank you so much for the way you've opened this up for all of us to take home and to deal with and to face, and, and we hope to work. And thank you again. Thank you for that comment. We did one of these events in Chicago at the, um, uh, the Church of St. Sabina, uh, which is run by Father Michael Flager, who's a very well-known activist and uh, gun violence prevention activist. Uh, one of the powerful things that he said there was that one of the places where he sees um, the least conversation of gun violence going on is in places of worship. This is coming from a clergyman. Um, so I don't know what your religious backgrounds are or <laughs> whether you attend a place of worship, but if you do, I would encourage you to bring this up with your religious leaders and ask them to have conversations in your congregations about this. Someone else? Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank Major Jackson for your poem, and especially acknowledging Michael Brown and the whole dark surrealism of, of that whole event, but especially your acknowledging of humanity. Michael Brown's humanity, guess what, we're all humans. All of our humanity. And, um, you know, I, I feel like as a country, we have been witnessing atrocities for a long time. We know this. And we've been asking, we've been witnessing for a long time, what do we 
do. Well, I, I suggest humanizing. I suggest seeing each other as humans. Uh, like one of them suggested being nice. Uh, treating each other as humans. Um, I came there a half hour before the show and was just sitting on the bench in front of the library and watched several people come by and question my place. Because I'm an unknown black man sitting on the bench in the dark. So, I'm just saying that to remind all of us that Peace and love and humanity is a 24-hour practice. Uh, it's something that should be practiced just like it should have to Michael Brown. Uh, it's practiced after you leave here. It's practiced before you come here. It's a 24-hour thing. Uh, humanity. Or comment? Sure. I spent a teacher. spent the first five years. I'm sorry, I can't hear you on the Sure. I'm a teacher and I spent the first five years of my teaching career in Los Angeles. And my second year of teaching, within the first month, uh, one of my brightest students was murdered mm -hmm. uh, in his front yard. And I just went out with his memory today. His name is uh, Elaine Castillo. Let's have a moment for Elaine Castillo. Thank you. Yes. I would just say that a lot of the insanity that we're seeing now in the world, I think, comes from misinformation and uh, not recognizing each other as human beings and loving each other that way. And next Wednesday here, Mark Potok is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, formerly with the Southern Poverty Law Center, will be speaking uh, from 7 to 8.30. And I would encourage anybody who is available to come and listen to the other Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for encouraging people to get out and vote. Because there are a lot of people out there that are too young, mm -hmm. so they're for whatever other reason they can't. So even if you have no skin in the game, get out and do it for that. Yes. Vote. <laughs> yes, George. I think that with the technology available nowadays, to begin with, we should turn on the lights so we can see who we're dealing with. OK, George. <laughs> We have a lot of technology available nowadays. It can be used in the schools. We should encourage the voters to appropriate enough money since we use the latest information and technology to keep our kids safe in school. Yes. And it goes all the way from maybe putting a dog in there that knows more than some of the administrators <laughs> in that particular area. Thank you, George. We can all agree that it's a priority to keep kids safe in school, I definitely. Um, one more question, and then we'll go to um, book sales society. Or two more, I'm sorry. Miss. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, I'll try to, uh, can't hear you. Oh, sorry, can you guys hear me? I, I can repeat things if you want to. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, outside of legislation, are there any um, outreach groups that are based on kind of a focus on communities disarming themselves, where people can volunteer to hand over their guns if they wanted to, or um, they can maybe open those conversations up with family members, or other community members. Are there outreach groups like that? And if so, what are their names, and um, how do we find out about them? So the question is about outreach groups of voluntarily disarming um, of personal weapons. Yeah, do, you want to, um, do you want to come up? There, there, there. 
So there, there's not really a volunteer group, but there are groups that do gun buybacks. Okay, so in major cities, they do them. In the state of Vermont, they're a little nervous about doing a public gun buyback. Um, but I will tell you that um, in other states, they do them. They've done them in Connecticut. They've done, in, done them in various places. Um, as part of this last legislative effort, all the guns that um, are in storage in the state of Vermont are going to be um, uh, uh, praised by a gun dealer, and then they're going to be sold to the public. So, um, to, to a gun dealer who will then sell all those guns. So, um, there's a couple of, there's a couple of um, groups, uh, um, ourselves and a group called Pennywise Foundation, and we've gone all over to the big people to ask them what it would take for us to um, get those guns and give them to artists and make them into plowshares. Um, but we're afraid that before we can actually do that, they'll, they'll be sold, before we get enough money to do it. But we have also just asked the city of Burlington if we can do a gun buyback. I mean, not me personally, but if they would do a gun buyback, because the police can do them um, pretty easily. So it would be a matter of us just all trying to get together and um, talk to the people. I feel like there's areas we could do it in Vermont, um, and the president of our C3 board is, is re has been reaching out to try to do one. So I say we're not going to do one, but people want to do one. And if you give me your name and you're really interested in that, I'm going to put you in contact with um, the people that are trying to do it. I would love to do it. There would be nothing that would make my day than to buy all those guns. They told me I'd have to become a gun dealer, but I'm sure I could find one. Um, and I would buy all those guns, and they would go to artists, and they would become plowshares, and then they would be given to farmers or, or whoever, right? That is like my biggest dream. sell the jewelry that has a number from the weapon that was nothing but stamped on the jewelry. And they take the money that they raise from selling the jewelry and put them into more gun buyback programs. So caliber and liberty. So maybe I'm gonna call them and figure out how they do that and then they can help us get all the guns that are gonna go back out on the street. One more. Yes. I just remember there was a time when children would brought their guns, their toy guns, and, and I forget what happened to them, but they were disarming themselves. And I think also it comes back to uh, how much violence there is in, in media, in the movies and on television. And so there's so many layers to this, mm -hmm. but again, it's the children also actively participating in this and understanding when they're playing with their 